All right, cool. Back to Baudrillard. Uh, so, Carnival and Cannibal, Ventriloquist Evil. This book came out toward the end of... Uh, I guess it would have actually only come out after he had died, being published in the original French in 08, when he died in 07. So this book is in many ways, uh, I think, where where his entire project was, was heading towards. That is, the, it is in this text that I think we see the, the apiothis, or the kind of climax of his critique of the West. So as I did last time with Baudrillard talking about the spirit of terrorism, it's pretty clear there that he uh, doesn't care much for the quote-unquote West and sees uh, some validity behind um, terrorist actions to usurp that Western authority. So here he gets into that, but considers the way that marginalized communities around the world uh, retaliate against this this authority without necessarily taking upon themselves a um, kind of terroristic persona, you know, one that would be incredibly violent and very direct. So as he begins, he says, We may see modernity as the initial adventure of the European West, then as an immense farce repeating itself on a planetary scale in all those latitudes to which Western religious, technical, economic, and political values have been exported. So what this represents for Baudrillard is a totalizing hegemonic framework. Now there's a distinction to be made here between hegemony and domination. This is something that he expounds upon in uh, another book, The Agony of Power, where he says that we are guided now by the logic of hegemony rather than that of domination, because domination implies a single locus of power, one that can be identified and, and therefore um, usurped. So now the situation we find ourselves in, very much in line with the kind of Foucauldian idea of the capillary effects of power, so that would be the idea that power forms something of like a web, where it's difficult to discern a single point from which it emanates. Baudrillard is suggesting that the world is governed by this hegemonic uh, form. But what is important to understand in Baudrillard's work, and this portends his critique of Foucault, is that he never wants to make it seem as though power is absolute. So we can kind of get that sense here with this book when he's saying something like hegemony, uh, where power isn't in a single point. Because I think, to some extent, he doesn't want to um, revitalize the idea of power. Because power for him is an outdated concept. Sure, at the time of kings and, you know, nobility and all that type of thing, uh, power could be said to have existed, sure. And his critique of Foucault pretty much suggests that uh, Foucault, without considering the way that power is reversible, I'll explain that in a minute, uh, Baudrillard believes that Foucault was therefore incapable of identifying it as it really is, and instead was just erecting uh, a kind of nostalgic form. So reversibility for Baudrillard is an idea that's present in his early work. And around the time of, that he writes Seduction, the book Seduction, in the late 70s, uh, reversibility essentially becomes seduction. So that is the idea that no single thing, point, idea, or anything, is finished in and of itself. Rather, it is always susceptible to what I will just call now its antithesis. So whereas in the Hegelian framework, right, you have uh, two opposing ideas. You have the thesis and the antithesis that collide to some extent and birth uh, a synthesis, which then becomes the new thesis. For Baudrillard, there's always a kind of antagonism between um, a thesis and an antithesis that don't resolve in, um, in a synthesis in the way that it may have once been envisioned. Instead, these two poles are in constant... Um, a kind of agonistic struggle, always. So there's a friction there. And by virtue of there being a friction, they adapt and change and, and develop. So that is why in one interview, and I can't remember where exactly he says this, 
because the interview asks him, interviewer asks him, um, why is it that you rely so heavily on the idea of binaries when you claim to be like this a radical thinker? Whereas we would believe binaries to be something of the past, right? Binaries to be a thing um, housed within the determining logic of patriarchy or, or you know, insert um, insert discriminatory ideology here. Uh, to which Baudrillard says, well, binaries are in many ways necessary for there to be development because binaries present in their kind of absolute form where I would, me, I would say that this can also manifest itself in a number of other ways, that is, trinary or quadnary or pentanary, I don't, I don't know what all the other terms are. Um, as long as there is some struggle between two or more different poles that demand that things change and develop in accordance with the others. So that doesn't imply uh, a kind of positivism or a telos, where things just move... Uh, in a straight line, or and that straight line being in um, kind of benevolent direction, this is instead to suggest that things are never determined. Things are always susceptible to change, and that change could be could correspond to a positive thing. It could be uh, negative. Who who's to say? So the entire logic of reversibility implies that any single pole is defined, and not only that is determined in being precisely by its being in proximity to another pole. So some of the examples that he gives is that um, hot seduces cold and cold seduces hot. The masculine seduces the feminine, the feminine seduces the masculine, where these things are always in, um, by virtue of their being in contact, proximity to one another, are always susceptible to various changes. So this idea of reversibility sets the stage for how he imagines this form of global power that we see emerging. Remember, it's a hegemonic power, though, where there's a kind of universalization of, uh, you know, Western ideas, ideals, uh, that are never absolute. Because, as he comes to say, the people that it affects most greatly overhaul, or overhaul, challenge that authority, not by necessarily uh, exacting some kind of terroristic revenge, but just by following the very logic of reversibility that he lays out earlier in his career, suggesting that no power is, is absolute. So there must be some pole, and in this case we can, it, it's not um, totally outlandish to believe that it would be the marginalized communities in the world that challenge that authority just by virtue of them being marginalized. So in his words, he says that this hegemony is accompanied by an extraordinary process of reversion in which power is slowly undermined, devoured, or cannibalized by the very people it carnivalizes. So that is those people. Um, And I think he's speaking mostly to the people uh, that would live in Africa, that people uh, obviously in the West uh, treat with infantilize so greatly. So greatly. Huh. Good. So the West carnivalizes, makes a joke of these people, and it's not um, limited to the African continent. It can apply to most places in the global south that the West looks upon with great disdain. Um, In response to this carnivalization, he's suggesting that there is a relative cannibalization. So this is kind of an interesting term to use because cannibalization implies that you're eating one of your own, right? So that would imply then that these people, by virtue of them being carnivalized, are entered into the same system, and then any sort of retaliation, drop the book, any sort of retaliation that they uh, exact is then, because they are within that system, then a form of cannibalization. This carnivalization can also, can take a few different forms, where um, the Western people, or whites, as Baudrillard says, uh, carnivalize the people that they uh, have marginalized or oppressed through a number of different ways, right? We appropriate various things that uh, from from those cultures, turning them or taking them from their sacred meaning that they might they might house, uh, and then they become desktop ornaments or something like that. Just you know, entering it into the 
banal culture industry. Or another term that comes up in uh, some of his other works is the idea of muse- museumification. That is, we put uh, the people, the cultures on display in museums, right? Kind of holding them in a state, uh, a state of suspension as a culture so that the Western gaze can keep feeding off of it. So any distinctions that we might have between races, Baudrillard suggests is, um, um, my God, it becomes blurred a little bit. Now, this is a problematic idea because it's, uh, it's a little, it's, of course, it's reductive of the ways that many cultures still exist today and aren't just simply, um, haven't simply been crushed by Western power. But I think that he makes a good point because there is a tendency, I think, and this phenomenon is going uh, around all over the globe, like the phenomenon of uh, whitening, skin whitening creams and and stuff like that, where there is a a drive towards this kind of, this idea of whiteness, whiteness being the uh, ultimate referent. So one way that we can think about this as well is with, uh, if anyone's ever watched TV in the last 20 years, they would have seen probably a Mr. Clean commercial, where in Mr. Clean commercials, there's everything is white. And I, I don't necessarily mean this to say like the, that it's racist uh, just by it being white. But if we think of the idea of cleanliness, the state of whiteness has virtually nothing to do with cleanliness. Because, you know, any surface, whatever color it is, will maintain its color when it's clean. But I think that we come to associate the idea of cleanliness with whiteness. And I think that that is very much an extension of what Baudrillard is describing here. The general whiteification of the of the globe or the attempt at, to do that. Even though, of course, it's, you know, th- there are so many resisting points. So in this process of appropriating other cultures, what the whites for Baudrillard do uh, is just reveal to the world that they are devoid of culture, that they must appropriate the other, they must conquer the other, precisely because they don't have anything to show for themselves. And, you know, it's difficult to validate this idea because, or it might not be, I just don't know, but the idea that um, a culture devoid of culture uh, are are they therefore more likely to engage in kind of imperialist or co- colonial actions? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how, but how do you measure that? You know, which culture is devoid of culture? <clears throat> but I think generally he has a, he has a fairly, fairly good point. Um, the relationship that people have with various, what might be considered sacred things in um, the West is not, as refined as it was in the past, even in the West, uh, but even in other parts of the globe. And I'm not going to name them because I don't know which. It's a very tricky idea. But in response to this carnivalization, or this general, or sorry, let me reframe that. In response to this global uh, attempt to, or project of appropriation, I think that carnivalization comes in. Where carnivalization, what it does, th- through it being a very um, per- performative type um, phenomenon or um, idea imposed upon the other, it reinstills the idea that there is some degree of otherness, as though you know the whole globe it hasn't already been mapped by satellites and all parts of the the world. If you know you step out of line you're going to feel the wrath of, you know, United States military power. At least that's the idea. Um, I think that this is where the idea of hyper-reality or simulation comes in because these people who were once considered other, which wasn't necessarily better, but just, you know, bear with me, or what Baudrillard calls it uh, in other texts that had a degree of a radical alterity, that is kind of radical difference, they are, the idea of that is maintained in, in its simulated form. So various cultures are then stereotyped in this way where our representation machines like the news media or film or television or anything like that 
uh, then continually performs that task of uh, stereotyping the other. And it is in this kind of simulated effort that people are galvanized in that image. Now, they don't necessarily embody that. I'm, I'm not saying that. But the, um, the powerful gaze then only sees them to be that, where people are not uh, allowed, as they would have been under the law of reversibility, as I kind of outlined it here, uh, would have been adaptable, changeable, kind of malleable. And instead, they become galvanized or fixed within this simulated form. But this uh, act of simulating the other only follows our own simulation, right? So this goes back to the idea from simulacra and simulation that, you know, the entire United States is Disneyland. And in order to make us feel better about that, we erect the Disneyland that we all know so that we can point to what is, you know, cartoon-like. So we have cartoons and say, you know, that's what um, the fake is. That is what is not real in order to convince ourselves that we are real. So this extends further than Disneyland where Baudrillard says, and it's quite funny, um, a majority of Americans desire the presence in the White House of someone whose stupidity and banality underwrite their own conformism. The more stupid he is, the less personally idiotic they will feel. Wow. Hit the nail right on the head with that one, especially today. But this is just isn't what the current president, Baudrillard gives the example of Arnold Schwarzenegger, where he says that Schwarzenegger to the office, or the his election to the office of governor of California, with this we are in total farce, where politics is entirely a matter of idols and fans. This is a huge step towards the demise of the representation representative system, and it is the inevitable outcome of current politics. Everywhere those who live by spectacle will die by it, and that goes as much for citizens as for politicians. So in the United States becoming a carnival them, themselves, uh, becoming a farce, they then put that farce onto the rest of the globe, try to make themselves feel better about it. But through this process of carnivalization, one that isn't necessarily enacted by, you know, some people in some hotel room somewhere in, some, in a conspiratorial fashion, but is rather something that the West is just doing without being aware of it. Um, the way that people respond to that within the West is often not so, uh, it's not good. It's not a good thing uh, where the other is then demonized to a certain extent, you know, treated as being lesser than so on and so forth. So Baudrillard says that we are, in fact, trying to wrest all these things from them, the other, or in the case of um, uh, the Muslim world, uh, trying to wrest it from them forcibly. So their modesty in the prisons of Abu Ghraib, the headscarf in our schools. But this is not enough to console us for our objection. And this is certainly true, and I'll get into that, but I'll just re keep reading. So they have come to it themselves. They have to sacrifice themselves on the altar of obscenity, transparency, pornography, and global simulation. So that, I think that really gets at what is, certain, is going on in many places around the globe. Uh, you know, the idea of the white savior, where white men go into parts of the world and claim that they're saving, or how does, I think Spivak, Spivak says it, she says, um, white men going to save brown women from brown men. So, and one of the um, kind of political dictums, dictums, dicta, dictum, that comes out of that is the idea that uh, the headscarf is a sign of oppression, right? And that in order to be free, you know, you must expose yourself. You must be uh, open to the world, which is, I think, Baudrillard is hitting... It right on the head here and where he says elsewhere in the transparency of evil or we could spin that a bit and call this the evil of transparency um Baudrillard is suggesting that there is a desire to make everything apparent or in his words to drag everything out on stage in order to make it seen because when things are seen they can be mapped they can be controlled where those sites that don't comply with this voyeuristic tendency but voyeuristic isn't uh, 
uh, charged enough, um, like a, uh, a neo-imperial, uh, in many ways, patriarchal gaze that wants to see all, you know, all women uh, be exposed and all that, uh, entering them into this logic of exposure that Baudrillard is so vehemently against, because at that level, the pornography of culture, the pornography of identity, people lose the possibility for anything symbolic, where symbolic exchange, going back to one of his other books in the mid-70s, uh, is something that's under assault by the jackals of science and, and a neoliberal doctrine and uh, the idea of transparency and, you know, the yeah, the YouTube science people, the hardcore atheists of the world, if you will. So that closes off the carnival and cannibal section and now pushes us into ventriloquist evil, where, where there is some repetition. So I'm going to do my best to just sift out the original ideas in here so that I'm, you know, I don't bore you with by repeating myself. So at the beginning of this it's not really a chapter, this part, um, Baudrillard suggests that his mobilization of what he calls a fragmentary form. So uh, this has a relationship with uh, a style that Nietzsche evokes in the genealogy of morality, where he says that he develops the aphoristic form or, or mobilizes the aphoristic form. That is the kind of blocky form of writing where uh, it's kind of single ideas presented in, you know, probably like a page, paragraph long, something like that, um, in order to sketch a, a broader project instead of it being a kind of linear, um, fluid thing. So of this, Baudrillard says that there is an original form of repetition, the form that expresses the fact that you only ever have one idea in your life, assuming you have the good fortune to have one, but that analyzing it allows you to nuance it or have it emerge or show through in spiral or anamorphic form. In fragment form, thought alludes constantly to a single idea, playing from varied unusual angles on perspective and illusion. There's a whole, whole art in unfurling a body of thought in which a way one ends up passing. Passing it by without seeing it. Passing it by without seeing it, sorry. This is the opposite of discourse which lays out its findings and arguments and sentences itself to house arrest within the precincts of its own conclusions. So the fragmentary form, if I'm understanding it right, uh, gets us closer to what I will kind of reluctantly call the truth of the world. That is a truth that isn't linear, a truth that isn't, um, you know, isn't explainable, that isn't clear but can at best be explained in kind of flare-ups, various little instances that house meaning within them. And the fragmentary form, I think, does that. So in Baudrillard's work, especially towards the end, um, you know, often his books are compiled of essays, and even those essays feel kind of choppy. So, and this is especially true in his Cool Memories series, which is just, you know... Uh, just memories, essentially, some just like a sentence long, uh, and he has five volumes of them. So there, you know, there's a lot in there. Um, but but of this, Baudrillard is suggesting that this fragmentary form, by virtue of its not abiding, or by virtue of its matching the kind of flare-up logic of the world, or, or a world that only presents itself in enigmatic disparate forms, the fragmentary form gets at the heart of that, which, you know, is maybe not all that important to bring up, uh, but when reading it, it helps to know that Baudrillard was conscious of his writing style, and it wasn't just kind of lazy um, thing he was doing. So it, to kind of get back to the what he's talking about, uh, the situation we find ourselves in, the kind of situation of global simulation, Baudrillard suggests that it has a, um, an indubitable affinity with capital, where he says that capital, or maybe not an, yeah, an affinity, but he says that it's an expression of it. Anyways, he says that capital is the purest expression of the reality principle. It has become reality. It produced it. It becomes it. And by disappearing, it will make it disappear as a consequence. The movement by which it became reality and which it is devouring, it is one and the same. 
In its advanced form, capital aims for ever-increasing abstraction and hence seeks to offload that machine for slowing down exchanges that reality might be said to, might be said to be. It therefore sacrifices it, and in the process, sacrifices itself. So this, you know, and one of the other ideas that Baudrillard, or phenomenon uh, that Baudrillard clings on to, is the dropping of the gold standard, where uh, money doesn't have any connection to gold, kind of Andrew Jackson type uh, nightmare. So in this process, in this kind of general abstraction, uh, we see that mirroring the abstraction of the world through simulation, through the kind of carnivalization of, of the globe. So we can see in capital, um, and it, whether or not one came before the other is difficult to say. I think Baudrillard would say that simulation came first, or this global simulacrum, uh, but other people would say different things, obviously. So it's, obvi it's difficult to say. But I think the point is still strong in that we can see in capital what is going on in uh, the kind of global sphere. So in keeping in line with this discussion of capital, uh, Baudrillard considers the role of the proletariat in this, in this framework where we have all become proletariats to some extent, where he says that the proletariat is, in effect, literally the prolific entity, the entity that has no other raison d'être than to multiply from the Latin proles, offspring, we may thus say that the human species in its entirety has been proletarianized by multiplying to infinity in the name of production, including demographic production, since the reproduction of the species has succumbed, as it were, to the unlimited industrial principle of growth. The human race has thus taken on collect collectively what was originally merely the fate of the poor. This was not the case in previous societies which offset any danger of surplus or overproduction, including the overproduction of human beings, by spontaneous regulatory mechanisms, which <laughs> wasn't a good thing. Uh, but what we are seeing here is another kind of oppressive mechanism. That is the logic of proliferation, right? Which keeps with many of his other arguments in other books. And how this proliferation can only go on so long before driving towards a kind of collapse, an implosion through uh, the explosion creating an implosion. So in this proliferation, we see not only the proliferation of subjugated bodies, we see the proliferation of a single idea. So all people give um, birth out of the same system. That is what Baudrillard calls the kind of uh, foundationalism without foundations or the, uh, no, the sorry, foundationalism without, fa oh God, what was it? Um, fundamentalism without foundation, sorry. And our fundamentalism is one that's predicated on science, technology, and technocracy. Anything that comes out of that is going to embody that very logic, which we see um, in this process of an eradication of all negativity, of all, uh, or at least the attempt to eradicate difference, eradicate the other, eradicate antagonism, eradicate negativity in favor of kind of, you know, scientific truth or positivism or technological positivism. So he, and this is where he talks about what the ventriloquist means, where he says that when the power of the negative fades, when the prohibitions, controls, and inequalities and differences disappear one by one, the better to internalize themselves in the mental sphere it is at this point that evil, as undesirable alien, becomes ventriloquist. So this is a difficult idea and one that I struggle with. But how I how I imagine it is that uh, evil, because it can't be fully eradicated, has to then kind of be sublimated. So it comes out in other ways. Uh, it comes out in the negativity posed by science, in the way that you know science creates pretty horrific things. Uh, not found in w where evil would have once been found. Uh, so that's the ventriloquist aspect of it, where it, it speaks through other domains, where it otherwise wouldn't have been thought to come out of. So this also speaks to Baudrillard's general thoughts about good and evil, where for him, if there's only good, that is, if the good has totally taken over what was evil, 
then the evil then the good becomes evil so as soon as good rules and claims to embody the truth it is evil that comes through so on the topic of ventriloquist evil to kind of illustrate it he gives us an example let us take the no to the european referendum so that referendum that he's referring to was in um 05 actually have a note here about it uh, so this refers to the French referendum of uh, May 2005 on the ratification of the European Constitution. So of this, Baudrillard says that it was clearly stupidity that voted no. It was statistically the most stupid, the backward, the retarded who voted no. But that stupidity was precisely the intelligence of evil. It was ventriloquist evil that replied no to the referendum, not the spirit of the negative which like the yes, lends its assess- assent to political reason, but an illogical no resistant to political reason and shot through with the exigency not to be annexed or taken hostage by any model whatever, even an ideal one. The exigency not to lend itself to the dialectical stratagem. Your no is a no to Europe as it is, but a yes to Europe as it should be. So the idea that... Um, any kind of pure idea taken as, you know, the absolute perfect idea will never, according to Baudrillard, because I think he's getting at kind of the ontological condition of humanity, uh, will never be totally accepted. Because that, if it was, that would present a more oppressive system than anything else realized. There will always be zones that oppose it. And those zones don't necessarily comply to the general logic of any system, but these zones are relics of a time when reversibility reigned, where there was this um, antagonism between two poles, and it is the kind of residue of that, because if that goes away, then we will enter something, as I just said, uh, much more oppressive than what the no in this case represents. So from this, he moves into an example of someone named Gilmore, um, Right, Gilmore's piece, uh, The Executioner's Song, where uh, Baudrillard suggests that this, this um, character uh, has a right to die, where death should be a human right. Because death, and this harkens back to the book Symbolic Exchange and Death, where Baudrillard says that humans have been um, d- denied their right to death which would signify an ownership of themselves that goes beyond state or corporate control. So Baudrillard uses this example to suggest that um, we are caught in a state of life suspension where we are forced to live you know, as long as possible, where now there are some pretty radical ideas coming out. And Baudrillard was, like, I think, really ahead of his time with this because uh, these ideas are coming out, and they're certainly not popular ones. Uh, in some um, critical disability, and uh, I know one trans scholar working on this stuff, talking about assisted suicide as being something that should be welcomed. Uh, so people should, if they living in, an, in a stable environment for a certain amount of time, truly for themselves want to die, then there should be uh, ways to um, uh, make that happen. So you have you could introduce things like death doulas uh, to kind of to facilitate that process and to make it easier, because it's kind of absurd that we deny people the right to die. You know, this harkens back to the Christian doctrine that has such a strong uh, place in our in our world. Uh, and what Baudrillard suggests is that death is something that can't be mapped, can't be understood, and is therefore something that we try to exercise, we try to get rid of, which is all just the project of um, denying people their autonomy, as though death is a bad thing, even though it happens to everyone. Uh, Because for Baudrillard, there were times when people would treat death and would treat the dead with a degree of respect that, you know, we don't have today. So one, uh, one example he gives is the case of the Aztecs that would sacrifice people in order to fuel the sun right or to keep the sun shining we don't have that kind of relationship to death anymore which you know 
say what you will, could be a good or a bad thing, uh, but it is a change. And with this change, I think Baudrillard is right that there has been a um, uh, kind of accepted control over human bodies, over human beings, to deny themselves that autonomy over themselves that would allow them to say yes to death. But of course, I should say, like, if there are, uh, if certain people are, um, you know, doing this more than others, then there has to be, uh, we have to be looking at the environmental conditions that are making this this happen. Whereas if it's a more, um, it happens equally across the board, then I think that would represent uh, the attainment of a kind of equal system where people had the ability to to say no to the, to life without there being, you know, things like bad things like discrimination or economic inequality um, that, you know, push people in that direction, which of course would be bad. So in the face of this, Baudrillard doesn't really give us, like, to in the face of this totalizing, globalizing project, Baudrillard doesn't really tell us what to do. But we have to, in a sense... Um, first of all, recognize what is going on, at least for Baudrillard, that is, you know, the traditional understandings of, of the world should be thrown out the window in favor of what Baudrillard is giving us, notably this move towards totalization, that doesn't happen on the surface. It's very, it's surreptitious, it's sneaky. But in response to this, we have to take like the opposite position. If the world is driving towards a kind of totalizing perfect system, you know, we must embrace the imperfect, whatever that looks like. We have to oppose the uh, the scientific rationality and the imperialism often um, mobilized in its name with a system that says no to that. Or as he says in this book, it's not enough to not want to be dominated. We must also renounce We must also renounce the desire to dominate, which is a little bit fairy dust-like, a little pie in the sky. But I think it's still, you know, useful in that, as he says elsewhere, you know, in response to a world that has grown perfect, uh, we must be enigmatic. And by virtue of it becoming perfect does in itself become enigmatic, because how can we imagine that? Uh, but we must, to oppose the system, be more enigmatic than the system is. But yeah, I guess it's on that note that that, that one ends. I um, I think there, I'm really hitting the end here of Baudrillard, and then that'll be done. Got maybe one or two more books to do, and then that'll be it for old Bodhi. Uh, move on to other things. But yeah, for anyone who listened to this one, hope you liked it. And if you had any problems with what I said, you know where to leave it. Um, I prefer comments to anything else, so do what you want, but um, don't feel the need to do anything other than comment, because I'd like to hear from you. But with that being said, 